So hello everyone and uh, welcome and thank you so much for coming um, to our second meeting for this fall semester. May I remind you, as I said, this session is and the following discussion are being recorded and they will be uploaded to our YouTube channel and Facebook page where you can already find the recordings of our previous lectures. It is my absolute honor to present Professor Warren Brown from the California Institute of Technology. Professor Brown is a historian of the social and political history of early medieval Europe. His work has focused on power, law, conflict resolution, both peaceful and violent, writing and the use of written documents by lay people. Among other awards and honors, in 2013, Professor Brown received the uh, Donald Bolo Fellowship in Medieval History at the Institute of Medieval Studies at the University of St. Andrews. And in 2019, he was a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton University. Together with um, Piotr Goretsky, he edits the Medieval World series at Routledge Press. Professor Brown's recent publications include Documentary Culture and the Laity in, early, in the Early Middle Ages, which he wrote with uh, Marius Costumbees, uh, Matthew Innes, and Adam Costo. Violence in Medieval Europe, Conflict in Medieval Europe, Changing Perspective on Society and Culture, which he wrote with Piotr Goretsky, and the exciting, which I'm excited for very much, and forthcoming, uh, Beyond the Monastery Walls, Laymen and Women in Early Medieval Legal Formularies, to be published with Cambridge University Press. Today, Professor Brown will talk about freedom and unfreedom in the Carolingian formula collections, we will take questions after the lecture. So if you wish to do so, please uh, send your name or question if you want me to ask it uh, to me. My name is Shaha Orlinski. Um, and now without further ado, Professor Brown, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanna thank you, Shahar, and more for putting together this talk and for inviting such an amazing group. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm aware that this is a diverse audience, uh, some specialists, some less so, so I've pitched the talk accordingly. Uh, so hopefully it will be accessible to those of you who are less familiar with this material uh, while still uh, having something for the specialists. Uh, I just wanna make sure that everybody can see my PowerPoint. You should be seeing my, my title slide, okay. When students of the early Middle Ages in Europe, which I define as roughly running from 500 to 1000 of the Common Era, talk about people whose legal freedom was restricted in some way, they tend to avoid the words slave or serf. Instead, they use the word unfree. Well, this is an odd word. It might even seem a bit contrived, particularly to those of us in the modern West who are conditioned to think that you are either free or you aren't. But for early medievalists, the word solves or at least papers over a problem. Early medieval Europe was populated by a significant number of people who were plainly not fully free, but just as plainly were not slaves, say in the way that slaves in the antebellum South of the United States were slaves, or that slaves on a great Roman estate had been slaves. Nor, however, were they all serfs, as serfs came to be defined by lawyers in the high Middle Ages, that is, as peasants who did not own the land that they lived on and who were under the complete control of their lords, but whose dues and other obligations were limited by law and custom. Instead, what we have is a variety of people living in a variety of dependent relationships, ranging from what looks like chattel slavery to a loose sort of patronage, whose diversity defies e easy labeling. These are the farm and estate workers, the household servants, the armed retainers, and other dependents who appear usually on the margins of our sources, which for the most part focus on the deeds of the powerful, the wealthy, the holy, or all of the above. The sources identify these people with an array of Latin terms, such as servus, anquila, mancipium, vernaculus and vernacula, colonus, colonna, acola, libertus, and liberta. The meanings of these words were originally fairly straightforward. To the Romans, servus meant male slave, anquila, a female slave. 
Moncipium literally meant one who had been purchased. Vernaculus is a diminutive of the word werna, which meant house slave. Colonus, which originally simply meant farmer, came in late antiquity to mean farmers that were legally free, but bound by law along with their descendants to the land they farmed so that they would keep producing tax revenue. Aquila meant neighbor or someone who lived nearby. Liberta and Libertae were men and women who had been freed from slavery, but had not been given the status of Roman citizen and the complete legal freedom that went with it. They remained legally obligated to the people who had freed them. But by the early Middle Ages, these words are being used in overlapping and sometimes contradictory ways to refer to a bewildering array of, array of dependent relationships. It is possible to make some rough generalizations. Serwi, Ankylai, Mancipia, and Wanakuli are usually at the bottom of the pile. They are most likely to appear in contexts that resemble chattel slavery, that is, where they appear to be at the complete disposal of their lords. They could not normally pass their property onto their heirs or move from one place to another. They were subject to things from which free people were exempt, like corporal punishment and judicial torture. Yet sometimes they appear to live in conditions very like those with labels that point towards a semi-freedom, like Colonus or Aquila. That is, they were bound to their land but could not be arbitrarily removed from it. They could go to some kind of court to raise disputes, but not to all courts, etc. However fuzzy these words might have become with respect to each other, however, all of them clearly distinguish their bearers from those who were fully free. The liberi, the ingenui, or the franchi, this latter being an ethnic term for the Franks that was mapped onto the idea of complete freedom. These are the people who our sources tell us had the right to freely dispose of their persons and property and to go where they chose. Since it is hard to say exactly what these terms mean or to distinguish one from the other, we are left with two ways to talk about them. We can either cop out and use whatever Latin term our source happens to be using, like servus, without translating it, and leave it up to the reader to poke at the ambiguities that we leave behind. And I confess that I've been guilty of this. Or we can use the catch-all term, unfree. The word unfree also solves another problem. It helps those of us who want to stay clear of the raging debates among early medieval social historians about when Roman slavery ended and high medieval serfdom began and how Europe got from one to the other. No one has come up with conclusive answers. Roman style chattel slavery survived for a very long time or it died out with the fall of the empire in the West or it survived only among women while men's conditions improved. The so-called feudal revolution of the year 1000, in which institutions of public government were allegedly swept away by castle-based lords intent on imposing their lordship by force, saw slaves semi-free like the coloni or liberti and free peasant farmers compressed by the brutal reality of their common subjection into a uniform class of serfs. Or they didn't because slaves were already gone and the feudal revolution never happened. You get the idea. Using terms like slave or serf to talk about the period between 500 and 1000, therefore, can be dangerous business, because by doing so, you can signal your position in these debates and provoke opposition, or reveal your naive ignorance of the debates and get laughed at. Unfort ultimately, the term unfreedom is a blunt but useful tool that gives us a general way to talk about these people in early medieval society who were less than fully free, but were not quite slaves in the classic sense, and who did not have the developed legal systems of the high Middle Ages to tell them and us who they were. Their numbers indicate that however they might live on the margins of our sources, they were important. Most of what we know about the early medieval unfree comes from texts produced in the eighth, ninth, and 10th centuries. This is the Carolingian period, when Europe was ruled by members of the family of the Frankish king and emperor Charlemagne, and when political cult and cultural changes in Europe 
drove the production of documents to new heights and created the institutional infrastructure for storing them on a large scale. This infrastructure was anchored in churches and monasteries, which alone of early medieval institutions survived past the Middle Ages themselves. Not surprisingly, therefore, this is where most of our sources come from, church and monastery libraries and archives. As a consequence, we see the unfree most often in contexts where they were interacting with churches or monasteries in some way. For example, they appear in church or monastery property records, in lists of property that a church or monastery received as a gift, that it bought or sold, exchanged, or loaned out. As for example, in this Bavarian charter of 792 that describes a priest named Arpert giving the church at Freising property that included, quote, a place of prayer together with altars, dwellings, gardens, houses, fields, woods, pools, and running water, goods both movable and immovable, with the Serwi and Ankili dwelling there or serving in the house, unquote. We also have a precious handful of estate records or polyptics that were put together by large Carolingian monasteries to document where their property holdings were, who lived on them, and what income they could expect from them. The polyptics tell us what kinds of dues or services on free people on major estates might owe, what their households looked like, etc. This example comes from a polyptic compiled in the 820s for the monastery of Saint-Germain-des-Prés near Paris. On an estate called Villaris lived a colonist named Bodo with his wife, the Colonna Ermentrude and their three children. The entry tells us how much land Bodo worked and what he used it for, what his dues were and what services he owed. And many of you will recognize this as the entry that it's at the basis for Eileen Power's famous uh, article, The Peasant Bodo. We also have some records of disputes in which ecclesiastical institutions or sometimes lay landowners tried to claim people as their unfree or fought with each other over ownership of unfree or in which unfree people themselves contested their status. In a spectacular case of the latter from 861, for example, 41 men and women from a villa belonging to the Abbey of Saint-Denis near Paris came before Charlemagne's grandson, Charles the Bald, at the royal palace at Compiègne, here, and complained that they were being unjustly subjected to, quote, inferior service, unquote, despite the fact that they were, quote, free colony by birth, unquote. This case and others like it suggest what Alice Rio has recently argued in her book on slavery in the West after Rome, namely that the Carolingian period was one of creative ferment in which old words and concepts about status were being challenged, repurposed, and used in new ways as people on all sides, both free and unfree, both lords and dependents, negotiated their situations and sought their best advantage in a changing world. I am working with a source that opens a door into the lives of the Carolingian unfree wider than most. It gets us beyond the ecclesiastical bias of our sources, namely the Carolingian formula collections. These are collections of model documents that for the most part have had all specific information, such as names, places, dates, etc., removed. They served as templates for documents and as sources for formulaic language, for scribes writing documents, or for students who needed to learn how to write them. 36 surviving manuscripts contain significant collections of such formulas. They come from all Europe north of the Alp, with the exception of the far southwest, that is Aquitaine and Provence, and the far north northeast, Franconia, Thuringia, and Saxony. The earliest were copied out in the 8th century, most of them come from the 9th, the last ones appear in the 10th. These formula collections preserve models for documents that don't otherwise survive, including large numbers that record legal business involving lay people only. They also preserve a richer variety of document types, covering a wider variety of situations than we see in the surviving charters. Many of the formulas are fairly generic, but some of them leave in enough information or tell strange enough stories 
to reveal that they were taken from real life documents. However, they are not easy sources. To begin with, the formulas contain a great deal of anachronistic language. Some of them may have roots in procedures and ideas about legal institutions and legal order that are not Carolingian, but rather go back to the period of their predecessors, the Merovingians, and even to late Rome. Second, they are by definition disembodied texts. Since they lack dates, names, or places, it is hard to anchor them in a concrete historical reality. Without such anchors in an identifiable real world, it is hard to decide when and where any information they contain might apply, and easy to see them as anachronisms copied out of antiquarian interest. My approach has been to look for their historical anchors, not necessarily in their content, but in their manuscript contexts. That is, to look at them not as texts per se, as for example, the standard published edition in the NGH does, but rather as they were actually copied down in the manuscripts in which they actually survive. As best the paleography and codicology allow us to say, most if not all of the manuscripts containing formula collections were copied out and kept in churches and monasteries. To this degree then, they too are ecclesiastical records, but their timing is striking. Significant collections of formulas, and by this I mean more than one or two, start showing up in the later eighth century at about the same time that the early Carolingian kings were stepping up their efforts to use churches and monasteries to help them wield power, pushing them to improve their record keeping, and in general, expanding their use of writing as a tool of government. It is also the time when the scribes who wrote the surviving documents that we have who previously seemed to have been mostly local priests, become clearly anchored in major churches and monasteries. It appears then that among their responses to the new imperatives emanating from court, these churches and monasteries began to take over and professionalize the process of producing documents, not just for themselves, but for everyone. If this is true, then it is no accident that the formula collections show up when they do. They reflect their creator's sense for what documents might conceivably be useful, not only for themselves, but also for the lay people living around them. That the formula collections were designed for practical use is also revealed by the efforts their compilers put into selecting, adapting, and often updating the texts that they copied and arranging them into coherent groups, usually by subject or purpose. Formulas containing outdated or anachronistic language were frequently copied next to modern formulas that clearly reflect 8th or 9th century realities. Bits and pieces of older formula collections were mixed up with pieces of newer collections and documents from an institution's own archives to create entirely new collections that met that institution's particular needs. Individual formula texts from different sources were sometimes blended to create entirely new formulas that better fit what a particular scribe wanted. In short, the people who compiled the formula collections wanted to create accessible collections of model documents that were relevant or at least comprehensible in their worlds and that would be useful as sources of language or as templates for entire documents or as resources for teaching students. The outdated or anachronistic language in the formulas appears to have been preserved to bolster transactions with the authority of the legal past. The world the formulas fundamentally reflect, therefore, is that of the time when they were copied down in the extant manuscripts, the Carolingian period. And this world included a lot of unfree people. What I want to do for the rest of my time today is push deep into the formula collections and explore what they say about the unfree, the freed, and their relationships to the fully free. This is part of a larger work project that I'm working on in fact, that I'm within a few weeks of finishing, to explore the lives of the laity in general through the formula collections in an effort to say more about what they did when they were not directly interacting with churches and monasteries. Here, I'm not trying to more precisely define labels such as servus or colonus, nor do I want to try to answer the big slavery to serfdom question. Instead, I want to stand still in the Carolingian period 
look at the formulas on their own terms and explore what the people who compiled them thought that unfreedom meant and what documents concerning the unfree in their lives they were prepared to generate, particularly those that dealt with the world beyond the monastery walls. Because the formulas include copies of documents that no longer survive and include so many that deal with the affairs of lay people only, they offer us a picture of the unfree that is quite rich and goes well beyond what we can learn about them from other sources. The unfree appear in the formulas most often as the passive objects of other people's power and interests. As in the Frising Charter I mentioned in the beginning, they show up here in lists of the properties handed over when somebody makes a property gift, sale, or exchange. This example is in a manuscript from the monastery at Flavigny in Burgundy from the turn of the ninth century. It has a man giving a villa to his sworn follower as a reward for faithful service. Along with the lands, vineyards, woods, meadows, pastures, etc., he transfers the Acoli, Mancipia, and the Berti who live on the villa's lands. A bit farther along in the same manuscript is a formula in which a king confirms the freedom of a servus freed by the Frankish practice of throwing a silver penny. The servus was to be free, quote, just as other tenant farmers who by such a document are known to have been freed from the yoke of servitude in the presence of princes, unquote. The word for tenant farmer here is mansuarius, which means someone holding a farm or a, non, or a manse. Here, servus is subsumed into the broader mass of unfree farm holders. Still farther along, another formula shows us that unfreedom did not necessarily equate to low status. It is titled gift to a servus or gazindus. It has a man giving his sworn follower a gift of property as a reward for his faithful service. Gazindus is a Germanic word that refers to an armed retainer in a Lord's household. With this title then, the composer of this formula has prepared a text for a broad range of dependent relationships that could range from low status to high. He has implicitly placed unfree armed followers in the same pot as Serwi. However, he also suggests that Serwi could themselves be fairly high status. The list of gifted property is significant and includes Mancipia. It was apparently possible in the scribe's mind for Serwi to own other unfree. Like property, some unfree could be bought and sold. In this formula, one man sells a Serwis to another. He specifies that the Serwis is not a thief not a fugitive, but rather healthy and well-trained. Moving to a different collection, this manuscript was copied out somewhere in the Loire Valley in the middle of the eighth century and contains formulas from the Loire River city of Angers. Here a man sells a vernaculus to a married couple. The formulaic boilerplate once more blurs the distinction between words. It specifies that the buyers would henceforward have the power to do whatever they wanted with this vernaculus, just as with their other monkeypia. This example makes its subject, a servus, look the most like a slave in the classic sense of any I've found. It survives in a manuscript written somewhere in the Frankish kingdom in the early ninth century, whose formulas from their content appear to have come from Saint, about 125 kilometers southeast of Paris. This is another sale. It tells how a man came before a group of men in a specified place or in a market or in whatever place and purchased a servus from a merchant, homo negotiants. Also like property, unfree people were fought over. This formula in a late ninth century manuscript is a notice of default. Someone has shown up to a court, but his opponent has not. So the one who showed up gets a written statement that the other has defaulted. Here two men meet before a count's deputy. One sues the other saying that he was holding his servus unjustly. The defendant claims in turn that he had been given the servus by his father. The defendant is ordered to return on a specified night with 12 oath helpers and swear to his rights. He did, but his accuser did not appear, so the accuser was declared the default. In the same collection is evidence that unfree were sometimes beaten up and killed. 
Here, one man goes before a judicial assembly headed by a count and sues another, charging that the defendant had assaulted his service on the road and killed him. The accused is unable to deny the charge. On a more positive note, Unfree sometimes received gifts. We've already seen the case where a serwus or an armed detainer, the Bizindus, received a substantial gift of property, including other Unfree, as a reward for faithful service. In this example from the Angers collection I just mentioned, a man responds to a request by his nutritus, that is, someone, be it servant or retainer, that he fed in his own household, and gives him a small piece of property in recognition of his service. The most important gift a Lord could give one of his unfree, you might think, would be his freedom, and so it is. The most common formulas dealing with unfree represent so-called manumission charters, by which an unfree is freed. These do not necessarily represent selfless acts of selfless generosity. The person granting the freedom is usually getting as much or more out of the deal as the person being freed. Most often the unfree are freed as an act of religious piety to benefit the souls of those doing the freeing. This example in our Flavigny manuscript expresses this purpose in its opening statement, quote, he who remits the debt of servitude owed to him may trust that in the future benefit will be returned to him with God. Therefore, I, in the name of God, A, for the salvation of my soul and eternal recompense, order that my rightfully owned service named B be free, unquote. What free means in any given case, however, is not self-evident. The manumission formulas reflect a world in which there are gradations of freedom. They clearly distinguish between limited freedom and full freedom. Here is another formula from our Flavigny manuscript that provides for limited freedom. It starts off by saying that its subject would be freed from all chains of servitude to lead a free life, just as if he had been born of free parents, and that none of the grantor's heirs or anyone else would have the power to demand any service from him, except, quote, that you must have the protection under full freedom of whichever of my heirs you will choose and must provide my communion hosts and lights every year in the place where my body lies." Unquote. In other words, the newly freed person is required to enter into a formal arrangement of protection with one of the grantor's heirs. He was also required to provide the materials for an annual memorial service at his former lord's tomb. Arrangements like this benefited both sides. The unfree rose in status compared to their peers, which may have had positive effects on the dues and services they owed. More important, they were given a support network in the form of their patron and his household that was vital in a world where your survival frequently depended on the network of kin, friends, and patrons you could mobilize to help you, and which unfree might lack. Two entries up in this manuscript is a formula that acknowledges this. It grants its subject freedom, but says, quote, if it should seem necessary to you for the sake of maintaining your freedom, you have license to choose the protection of a church or of whomever you might please without prejudice to your freedom, unquote. Different are the manumission formulas that make their subjects fully free. Many of these couch what they are doing in the ancient language of Roman citizenship. In this example from the Flavigny manuscript that I just presented as an example of a pious manumission, the actor frees his service before the altar of a church so that, quote, henceforward, as if he had been born or begotten by free parents, he might go and travel to whatever place he might wish and lead a free life just as other Roman citizens, unquote. It goes on to specify that he could choose patronage or protection wherever he wanted. He was to be subject to God alone to whom all are subject. All of the examples I've discussed so far represent unfree as the passive objects of other people's power, interests, or generosity. However, the formulas also tell us that they were real people who had agency and who used it. For example, they sometimes ran away. 
one of the sale formulas in the Flavigny manuscript that I showed you earlier addresses this possibility when it guarantees that the service service being sold was not a fugitive. This text, which was copied into four 8th or 9th century manuscripts, addresses such a case directly. A man named A comes before a king and his leading men and sues a man named B. He charges that his own service named C had stolen property and had run away with it and that B had received the fugitive and was keeping him. It also appears that unfree could amass their own property and wealth, enough so that they could buy their freedom. In this formula from the Salt Collection, the writer says that the recipient of this document had redeemed himself and all of his property from the writer's service in exchange for a money payment. It is well known, whoops, I advanced too soon. It is well known that Unfree in this period got married. I mentioned at the beginning, for example, the Colonus Bodo and his wife, the Colonna Ermentrude in the Polyptic of Saint Germain de Pre. That same polyptic also tells us that they married across status boundaries. It shows us, for example, marriages between Serwi and Ankilai on the one hand and Coloni on the other. And every once in a while, marriages between Coloni and what the polyptic calls free people, Liberi, even though they're still numbered among the monastery's dependents. It is with this latter type of relationship that the formulas are concerned. Marriages between free and unfree people were in general not kosher. The early medieval law codes, for example, almost uniformly aimed to strictly separate free from unfree. <clears throat> However, <clears throat> excuse me, outside of the laws, there is evidence that these mixed marriages were at least sometimes treated more flexibly. For example, sometime between 801 and 814, Charlemagne himself issued a decree concerning documents issued by the lords of Serwi who had married free women, granting their children freedom. Charlemagne recognized these documents as valid. The kind of document that Charlemagne's decree refers to shows up not once, but several times among the formulas. Apparently, Serwi married free women and their lords decided to protect the freedom of the woman and her children often enough that a number of scribes who compiled formula collections wanted to have examples of the requisite document. In this late ninth century example, a man states that his servus had married a free girl. For the sake of piety, the writer writes the security for the girl saying that she might live securely with her husband, that she would not be subject to any claims to service either by himself or his heirs, and that any children that emerged from the union would be free. Returning to the Flavigny manuscript, this rather remarkable text recounts a case of bride theft, a broader phenomenon in this world that I don't have time to explore further here. A Lord writes to a woman acknowledging that one of his serwi had seized her without either her or her parents' permission and married her. He had as a consequence come in danger of his life, but friends and other good men had intervened and arranged a settlement, according to which the children of the union would remain free. And yet even here, we find the familiar ambiguity. The children's freedom was to be limited. They had to remain on the land of the writer and his sons and pay the dues required of the land they occupied, quote, as is the custom for free persons, unquote. Cases like this point to an attitude towards the law that is visible in other contexts in the formulas and also in other early medieval sources. People seem in general to have been fully aware of what the law said about things, or in the case of matters not covered by the extant written law codes, legal custom. They do not seem to have regarded it, however, as strictly binding in all cases. Often they seem to have treated it as a point of departure for negotiation. In the case of mixed marriages, the letter of the law allowed lords to act from a position of strength. Free women who married their unfree would become their unfree themselves, along with any children they might have. But if the Lord's interests, his sense of justice, local politics, or simple affection dictated a different result, he was free to do something else, as long as he did it in writing. And the formulas were prepared for the apparently common case that they did. The marriage formulas also point up how fluid the dividing line was between free and unfree. 
By marrying free women, unfree men could work their way up the status ladder, or at least their children's way up. This may well have been one reason why they took the risk. But the formulas also show us people heading down, specifically by giving themselves into servitude. This could happen for a number of reasons. For example, poverty could overtake them, or they could find themselves needing protection. In this example from the Alger collection, a man oppressed by hunger and poverty gives himself into a Lord's service in exchange for money. This formula from Saul has a man writing to another saying that serious necessity and the worst kind of cares had oppressed him to the point that he had no way to feed and clothe himself. He had accordingly borrowed money from the recipient, but then found himself unable to repay the loan. He therefore signed over his freedom to the recipient such that, quote, whatever you do with your own mancipia, be it selling them, exchanging them, or imposing discipline, thus you shall have free and firm power of doing with me in all ways from this day on, unquote. Or perhaps someone sold himself into servitude simply because he wanted the money. This one in the Flavigny manuscript is simply a bald statement that one man gave himself into the unfree service of another in exchange for money. He states that henceforward his new lord could do with him, your servus, whatever he wished, just as with his other man Kipia. There's no statement of necessity or poverty. The most common reason that people gave or sold themselves into unfreedom, however, or at least the most common case for which the formulas were prepared, was to pay compensation for some offense. The formulas depict a colorful variety of such situations. In this one from the Flavigny manuscript, a man writes to his Lord. He had gotten into serious trouble, enough so that he had come in danger of his life. His Lord had stepped in and redeemed him by paying compensation. For what? The text doesn't say. The writer did not, however, have enough property to pay him back. He therefore surrendered his free status and entered his Lord's unfree service to do whatever the rest of the Lord's Sarah did. This formula appears only in an early 17th century copy that was taken from a now lost manuscript. A man admits to having broken into someone's storeroom and stolen goods of a certain value. He's brought before a court where he's ordered to pay compensation. He can't, so he agrees to become the servus of his victims. The formula even describes a ritual procedure whereby the man would put his neck in a yoke and be handed over by the hair of his head in the presence of witnesses. These formulas fit neatly with a society in which all wrongs were settled between the parties involved by compensation, backed up by the underlying threat of violent vengeance. The ultimate price was one's own person which you handed over if you had no other way of making good your offense. But some people in this society apparently took a very pragmatic view of their persons. They treated their status as a negotiable commodity. This one from Alger describes a situation in which one man had borrowed money from another and in exchange handed over his free status for a specified number of years. The arrangement was recorded in a document a deed of security, which the borrower had given to the lender. On repayment of the debt, the lender would normally have returned the security to the borrower. However, he had lost it. So he issued this one to the borrower stating that he had repaid his debt and declaring that if the original document were ever found, it would be null and void. Another formula from the same collection tells us that such arrangements could get quite precise. It has a man borrowing money and in place of collateral, giving over half of his free status. This translated in practical terms to the borrower working for the lender for a specified number of days per week. After a specified number of years, the borrower would repay the money and recover his complete freedom. What I find interesting about these cases is the way that they frame obligations in terms of legal status. When someone borrows money and agrees to work for his creditor until he is able to repay a loan, it is expressed in terms of giving up a portion of his free status. Until he had repaid the loan, he was not completely free. Imagine a world where if you needed to borrow money from someone and didn't have collateral, 
you could put yourself up as collateral and let that someone put you to work for a few days a week until you'd repaid the loan. This boundary layer between freedom and unfreedom that I've been talking about, that people could cross in either direction, could be a turbulent one. This shows up in documents dealing with disputes over status. As I said at the beginning, we have real documents describing such disputes. The formulas, however, offer us a richer variety of pictures. One great thing about the formula collections, for example, is since they were compiled to help scribe draft, scribes draft documents for all comers, they don't reflect any particular side's interests. A church or monastery is going to keep in its archive records of disputes in which it was the plaintiff, but only disputes that it won. It would have no incentive to keep records of dispute processes that it started and lost. In the formulas, however, we get to see plaintiffs lose. In this text from a late ninth century collection, a man named A comes before a judicial assembly headed by a count and sues a man named B. He declares that B ought to be his service by dissent and that he was unjustly withholding his service. B responded that he owed no services or dues or taxes, but was rather completely free. He uses the phrase free and salic. That is, he claimed status as a Frank. The court ordered him to come back within 40 nights and swear to his status with 12 old helpers. He did on the altar of a church and received this document recording that he had done what he was supposed to. This example from the Saint collection drives home that for all they frequently called themselves free, Colony were not in fact fully free. A man was trying to escape being claimed as a colonus. His accuser claimed that his father or his mother had been his colonus or colona, and therefore that he ought to be his colonus too. The accused had no response, so it was judged that he be returned to his accuser. It is in the dispute formulas again that we see that unfree people could own other unfree. In this example from Saul, a magnificent man A sues another man B, saying that B was the servus of A's colonus. He went so far as to display the document of sale by which B had been purchased. After the document was read out, B capitulated and returned himself to the colonus's service. What this suggests is that the colonus, while he had rights over the servus, could not himself go to court to assert them. He therefore asked his lord to do it for him. Finally, a particular set of disputed status cases suggests that at least some Carolingian unfree enjoyed a perhaps unexpected mobility and access to power. It seems that when they needed help, they were able to appeal to quite powerful people. Depending on where they were and who they knew, they might even get to the king or emperor. These cases are contained in the so-called imperial formulas, a set of formula for, formulas for imperial diplomas and letters that was put together sometime around 830 during the reign of Charlemagne's son, Louis the Pious, by someone who worked in the imperial writing office. In most of these formulas, the copyist left in enough specific information, like names and dates, to tell us that he had taken them from real documents recording actual cases. And yes, believe it or not, this is in fact Latin. These are all written in what are called Tyronean notes, which is an early medieval shorthand, which I cannot read. And so I am thoroughly grateful to those 19th century Germans who had the time and expertise to tackle this stuff. The title of this one speaks volumes. Order concerning those whose property and liberty has been unjustly taken by the powerful. The particular people in question <clears throat> were apparently willing and able to travel. Certain men from the territory of the city N, from the villa named N, had come before the emperor himself, charging that a count had unjustly taken their freedom. Imperial legates investigated and found their story to be true. The emperor freed them and their relatives and offspring from servitude. <clears throat> An unfree person could also gain access to power by getting someone connected to power to intercede on his or her behalf. This formula concerns a woman who managed to get to the ear of the emperor by appealing to the emperor's wife. 
the woman whose name is left out comes into the presence of the emperor, Louis, and states that her kin group had been unjustly pulled into the service of a royal estate by a legate of Louis' father, Charlemagne. She then pulls out a document saying that after Charlemagne's death, the matter had been brought to Louis' attention and Louis had issued an order restoring the kindred's freedom. However, she and her brother had been left off of this document so that they remained in servitude. She appealed to the emperor to restore their freedom. It is at this point that we learn how she got to him. Somehow she had ended up in the personal service of the emperor's wife, the empress Judith. She appealed to her mistress for help and Judith in turn spoke to the emperor. Louis in response restored the woman's freedom along with that of her brother. One final formula reveals that Carolingian and Unfree were not stupid. They were fully capable of working the system to their own advantage. It too is from the imperial formulas. It starts with a declaration of principle, the property of all freedmen, manumisi who are called liberti, who die intestate, that is without a written testament, their property goes to the king. But the text goes on to say that some freedmen gave their property to free men so that if they died without making a will or otherwise arranging their succession, these people would pass the property on as the freedmen wanted. In other words, you get around the restrictions on inheritance placed on freedmen by getting a helpful free person to act as a conduit for your property. The text goes on to say, however, that some of these free helpers were not honoring the donor's wishes and were instead keeping the property for themselves. In order to prevent this, a man named Albrecht, who had been a servus of Charlemagne and whom Charlemagne had freed, asked Charles's son Louis to officially guarantee that the property and goods that he had acquired after gaining his freedom go to his sons if any sudden event prevented him from arranging for this himself. Louis agreed. So by levering his connections to the Carolingian house, this Albrecht found a bulletproof way to make sure that his property went where he wanted it to. I want to pull all of this together with a comment about the unfree made by Charlemagne himself. Sometime between 801 and his death in 814, Charlemagne responded to a set of questions that had been posed to him by one of his legates. His answers were copied into a collection of legal texts sometime in the second half of the 10th century. First on the list is the following question. When a male servus marries a female colonna, should their children belong to the mother or to the father? Charlemagne responded by asking the legate to consider what he would do if one of his own servi should marry an anquila belonging to someone else, or if someone else's servus married one of his own anquila and to whom their children ought to belong, and then in this case do likewise. For, said the emperor, quote, there is no other than free and unfree, unquote. This last statement would seem to be unequivocal, but what comes before it echoes what we have seen in the formula collections. As Alice Rio has pointed out, Charlemagne was asking the legate here to think like a lord instead of trying to follow an objective rule. If a Lord Serwus married someone else's Ankila, the Lord would want the children to belong to the Serwus and therefore to him. If someone else's Serwus married the Lord's Ankila, he would want the children to belong to the Ankila and therefore to him. In other words, Charlemagne wanted the legate to go off and decide what should happen based on what he would want to have happen were he in the same situation. The formulas show us this flexibility as it played out in practice. The terminology of unfreedom is blurry, yet it mattered. For all that the boundaries between the categories were blurry, people cared whether they were colony or sewi, free or unfree. It is hard to say whether Charlemagne was right with his absolute statement that there were only free and not free. On the one hand, there are formulas that draw clear lines between the fully free and everyone else. But at the same time, other formulas show us a continuum of degrees of freedom all encompassed by the word free, that depended on circumstances and the individual purposes, power, and interests of the people involved. Some newly freed people might have been very glad to be put under someone else's protection, 
The worlds of the free and unfree were intimately intertwined. People up and down the power chain negotiated nicely or not so nicely for what they wanted, whether it was unfree running away and seeking refuge with another lord, whether it was lords claiming someone as unfree who might have seen their status differently, whether it was an unfree woman taking advantage of her relationship to the queen, or a free person stiffing a colonist who had given him property to pass on to his heirs by keeping the property himself. <clears throat> The marriage formulas, though, make Charlemagne's larger point. What really happened on the ground depended on the local political and social landscape and could be negotiated in a way that satisfied everyone, or at least satisfied those holding the cards at a given moment. The unfree appear to have been fully aware of their options, whether exploiting connections or walking long distances to see a royal legate. They were closely connected to, rather than strictly separated from, the society of the free whom they served and whose ranks some of them could join at the same time some of the free were joining theirs. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Professor Brown, for this stimulating lecture. I have about a million questions in my mind. Uh, um, but let me start with um, two questions we had from uh, Dennis Sahinko. Um, Dennis um, asked that I would ask the question, but um, if I'll ask it, and if I if I don't do it justice, then feel free to jump in. One second. Um, so uh, Dennis offers a definition of freedom from um, Else Rostal that goes as follows. Um, what he says, he uses this, this definition of freedom, um, self-determination and inviolability within limits established by the community. Um, and he goes on to ask um, if, you would agree, um, or rather be cautious towards such a definition. Um, and now I see, I'm sorry, it's just a bit of a mess here. Dennis, maybe do you want to jump in and ask your question? Because I'm butchering it. Um, yeah, slightly. Hi, um, I'm Dennis Akino Kamenko from the University of Gothenburg. Um, that was a very stimulating talk. And um, indeed, one of, one of the questions I myself had um, while I was teaching a class uh, in, um, in an earlier course, how to explain to, in my case, bachelor students, what an early medieval freedom or unfreedom was. And I use this definition I found in, um, in an article by uh, Horstall and Sørensen, this, uh, f uh, f how, how do they put it, the freedom? Uh, Self-determination and inviolability within limits established by the community. Would you agree with this definition or rather agree, or would you rather be cautious in using it, especially, for example, for educational reasons? Because I understand from your lecture that these concepts are extremely tricky and not very easily explainable in our mm -hmm. modern terms within our modern bourgeois society, where we have more or less clearly defined categories. Okay, I've got two responses. On the definition of self itself, I can live with that definition because of the clause subject to limits set by the community. And those limits set by the community will vary according to time, place, and culture. So that, you know, I think it's even a valid question to ask whether we in the modern West are fully free, if you count up all of the, the restrictions uh, that we have agreed to subject ourselves to to live in a modern state. Um, <clears throat> so I would, I would accept that since that clause gives me all sorts of wiggle room then to look at the specifics of the limitations imposed by a given community. As far as teaching goes, though, I would be cautious because one thing I at least I try to do in my classes is not to try to pretend that there is a unitary definition of something. Uh, you know, to avoid the exercise of let's poll all of the people and find a definition that we can all agree with and then we'll use it. I instead try to 
push the students towards seeing that the meaning of words can change. And so to confront them with the idea that to somebody living in the ninth century, you can still be free and restricted to living on your Lord's estate. Um, so that's how I would approach it. I don't know if I've helped. No, uh, that, that that is helpful only. In my in my case, I have very beginner beginner level students who are not even specializing in history. So for me, I have to sort of like cut the corners and be somewhat more straightforward because, I mean, otherwise I'll just get them even more confused than they were before they came. Uh, but but isn't, do I that, isn't that the joy of teaching, particularly beginning students, to watch them as they grapple for the very first time with their minds being blown by the yeah. concept that freedom might not mean freedom? <laughs> as long as you don't have to read their essays. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, that 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 is not an assault on my students. They're brilliant. The essays were great, for the record. But uh, if if I may ask another question here, do I understand you correctly, or the general message of this uh, very stimulating talk that it is probably unproductive to think of or to try to interpret concepts of freedom slash and freedom in this period and in this culture as something discrete? Maybe instead we should think of them as a sort of a spectra. Mm -hmm. Absolutely except that in certain situations, you can see them insisting on the distinction, but uh -huh. that insisting on the distinction is situational. Mm -hmm. It really and does I, depend on whose interests are at play. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say it's opportunistic if I interpret it correctly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, to start uh, the conversation going, maybe I'll use my privilege as a moderator uh, to ask something. It seemed to me that there is a, at least a correlation between your uh, access to legal protection or your ability to appeal to a court of law um, and perhaps your, your mundium, right? Your guardianship, or who has your guardianship, so to speak, if you are unfree or if you're a woman for that matter. Um, the only thing I'm curious about, and I, not the only, but one thing I'm curious about, and I would very much like to hear your, um, your take on it is, it seems on the one hand that if your guardianship, your mundium is not in your own hands, you're not, uh, you you cannot appeal to the court yourself. Um, th th that is, then you cannot appeal to the court yourself. But in uh, the formulary of Anje, if I remember correctly, we see that women need to give their husband sort of a, a legal mandate to run their their legal business. Otherwise, they cannot do it. Or how how would you explain it otherwise? Um, two ways. First to see a formula in the Angers collection in which a woman gives her husband a legal mandate, to me says that women sometimes gave their husbands legal mandates. It doesn't tell me that they needed to. Mm -hmm. It just says that they sometimes did. Um, and that fits better with the broader evidence that applies both to unfree and to women, which is at the same time you see, for example, a colonist who owns a Mancipium or whatever it was, I've forgotten, who has to go with his Lord to court. And you say, aha, Colony couldn't bring their own cases to court. But then you see a formula or a charter in which a bunch of Colony all hit the road and go to court themselves without their Lord's permission. See, the, 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 it's very, very difficult to draw prescriptive pictures of what people were and weren't supposed to do, because if you do that, the evidence contradicts itself. Uh, that's, again, where I tend to lean towards a situational approach to rules and norms. Sometimes people went with their lords. Sometimes women did need their husbands to speak for them. But then in other situations, you see women speaking for themselves and you mm -hmm. see unfree acting for themselves. So it's very difficult to make an absolute statement. Am I making any sense? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, Jennifer Davis has a question. Uh, thanks, Warren, for the paper. Um, yeah. I was thinking a little bit um, with the capitulary that you ended with, 
and that I knew, it. I knew you were going to say. <laughs> Sorry, about it's not <laughs> actually about capitularies, but it's just the way in. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so you know that that the the statement at the end, right? There's only slavery free. Right. Of course, that that's Roman law. I mean, that's just the classic Roman law dictum. Right. And that kind of direct citation of Roman law is very unusual in Charlemagne's capitularies. I mean, there's more in Charles the Bald, but for Charlemagne, strange. Um, but it did make me think back to a number of your examples that either implicitly or explicitly in, are engaging with Roman law. Mm -hmm. So it's in a lot of the Angers material in particular, right. perhaps because of the ultimate age of those formulae. Uh, it was it was it the Flavigny one that specifically talked about the Roman citizens, which right. again, interesting language to deploy mm -hmm. in the ninth century. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how the sort of Roman framework is reworked in these texts and what mm -hmm. it means in this radically different situation in the ninth century, where those kinds of very strict distinctions mm -hmm. that are the basis of Roman law, civil, criminal, slave free, right. et cetera, you know, they just don't work. Right. Um, I've got a whole chapter in my book devoted to this because it's an absolutely essential question for understanding the formulas. The short answer is <clears throat> Roman law is still there and Roman law is still being used as a normative framework for legitimating or justifying legal transactions. This is particularly true in the West, but some of this also migrates to Bavaria. You can see people in, you can see the formulas directly quoting the Lex Romana Visigatorum or the Breviary of Alaric. Um, and they're doing so in a way that indicates that they understand what they're quoting because it applies to what they're doing. Um, <clears throat> that's first. And it would take me a lot more time than we've got to lay out the evidence for this, but it, it's there. The other thing is that backs this up are real documents that also use this language. The Roman citizenship language in the formulas, the argument that I make is that Roman citizenship after the decree of 212 that made everybody a Roman citizen gradually ceased to mean a particular subgroup of people who enjoyed particular legal protections. And it came to be a code word simply for being fully free. Um, and the formulas, particularly the Western formulas, continue to use it this way. And you can also see real manumission charters doing this. There's one from St. Gall. Uh, in the imperial formulas is actually one written by Einhard himself that uses this language. Uh, there's also, and it persists for a very long time, there is a charter that was formularized and copied onto the back of one of the, uh, I think a copy of the, uh, one of the Aachen capitularies uh, that uses the Roman citizenship language and is dated to Otto the Great. Uh, so the language is still there being used as a label for fully free. Uh, when you put all of the pieces of Roman law references in the formulas together, it appears that not only is much of it still being understood, but just in general, it's still the imprimatur of antiquity. It's still part of making a document appear valid. Does that help? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I, I guess um, not to hijack this conversation, but I guess the follow up then sort of would be though, um, you know, very often the Roman law they're engaging with is going to be the Visigothic. It's going to, mm -hmm. it's the breviary, right? It's almost always the breviary, yeah. Right. So, which is, if you really want antiquity, though, use mm -hmm. the Theodosian Code, which they also have and they know and is inaccessible, right? So, is that telling us something about the kinds of practices that are shaping this, that they are using the breviary? rather than if you really want antiquity, you know, why don't you actually use the older version that you have and you know is older? That's a really interesting question. Uh, and I don't know the answer to it. All I can say is that when they directly quote Roman law, which they frequently do, particularly the tours formulas, uh, it's the breviary they're quoting, uh, usually the interpretations. Um, 
as for whether they were aware that, you know, just your average scribe in a monastery somewhere was aware that the Theodosian Code was the older text, or whether they regarded it all as just Roman law, I don't know. I don't have the equipment to answer. Um, it's a good question. I'll have to think about it more. Thank you. Now we have a question from uh, Professor McKitterick. Thank you, Shaha, and thank you, Warren, for a splendid paper. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. I was much struck by, well, I really like the way you're reading formularies. It's um, very constructive and interesting, but I was particularly struck by your phrase, he could do something else rather than what the law said, if he did it in writing. Mm -hmm. That relates then to the formularies themselves and the degree to which they are becoming rules because they are in writing, not just precedents, but actually then things for people to follow. That is a really good question that I have wrestled with and I try to address in the conclusion of my book. And it gets at the whole distinction between descriptive and prescriptive sources. And I agree with you completely that simply by virtue of existing, being copied into a book in some sort of allegedly authoritative form, that the formulas can then influence how people think, act, and write downstream. That they can they can they can tell people what they're doing and how they're doing it. Um, I agree with that completely. Does that get at? That's that's fine. Um, I'm glad you responded like that. It remains a problem, in other words. It does. Uh, the of this right. It's obviously, it's obviously something you can't prove. No. Uh, but it's it's something that, from circumstance, I can strongly suspect. We have now a question from Alan Bernstein. Do um, you want to ask your own question, or should I ask it for you? Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you. Yes, that was a terrific talk. I'm a non-specialist, but very interested in the Carolingians uh, and the formularies. Um, what occurred to me was that your talk addressed the spectrum of unfreedom to freedom in terms of adjectives and nouns. Okay. And I wonder if there's a similar spectrum in terms of verbs to make people unfree, to liberate them, to emancipate them, or to subject them or to punishment or, or to punish them. And the example that sticks in my mind is the case that you mentioned uh, where a, a, a subject person had offended a Lord and subjected himself to that Lord for a time in order to earn his pardon. And so of course, what I'm looking at is the parallel or the interaction between uh, the religious mindset, which is so important in so many Carolingian documents and the very secular <laughs> presentation that you gave just now. Hmm. That is a question that never occurred to me to ask. And so I'm sifting through my examples. Immediately what comes to mind is in manumission formulas, you will see manumitera used as a verb. Okay, I manumit this person as a verb. Heading the other way, I don't think so because very often the formulas still use the Roman law terminology of status. The word status actually meant in Roman law, your, your freedom. You either have status or you don't. If you're unfree, you don't have status. There's actually a line in Justinian that says, when somebody is freed, then he begins to have status. And so what they talk about in cases like the one you just described, they will say somebody gives up their status. Uh, so yeah, there's a verb involved there. Um, but what it is, it's being given up as a noun. I'm going to have to think about that some more. I'm curious, when you drew the comparison with the more religious material, could you explain what, what 
what you're talking about? Yeah, I'm talking about the debate over the appearance of purgatory and the middle status between heaven and hell. Oh. Um, in, in the most abstract uh, theological discussions, but in practice, uh, in, in um, just in religious practice in the monasteries, in, in administering penance, for example. Um, I know this will be a distraction to, the, to your audience right now, but uh, without your talk, I wouldn't have raised the question for myself, and I just wanted to share the question with you. That's a really good one. That would mean going off and reading penitentials and whatnot to see what conceptual language they're using when they're talking about those distinctions. Right, and the gifts that are given um, for the benefit of, of the deceased, mm -hmm. the parents and the ancestors, there's a similar kind of gradation. Uh, and so I just wondered what you would think of that parallel. And it struck me that verbs would be more instructive mm -hmm. than the nouns and adjectives you used. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, we have a question from uh, Neil O'Sullivan. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Hi. Thank you for that. That was really wonderful. Um, so I've been thinking. Um, a lot about what well, just mulling over during the questions you uh, so when you're talking about the situationality, or is that the right word? You know, how these type definitions, the different words, become very important in specific situations that they become, you know, they become very meaningful for the participants. Uh, mm -hmm. And reflecting a bit on what you said at the beginning about the circumstances in which the formularies are compiled and these things start being put into writing. And, and the more I'm thinking about it, the more I was wondering, and I would like to hear your opinions on this and whether it supports us in the examples, are we seeing almost something like Schrodinger's service here? Uh, a, a, a social relationship, which is, you know, very generally, uh, you know, we can tell that, that it's unequal and, and, and hierarchical, but which, which isn't really defined until it comes to that point of conflict when it needs to be written down, whether that's in a court case or when it's being, you know, when the, the unfree dependent is being transferred to a monastery or some, something like that. Um, going over some examples in my own head, I'm, it's something I felt oh, that might work, but I, I don't know what you think of what in, in terms of the broader formula, formula evidence. Is this something which is a, you know, not only a reflection of sociality, but also the fact that this is starting to be written down and being incorporated into written culture more often? Uh, this is brilliant. It never occurred to me to use the phrase Schrodinger's service, but I think I will in the future. Um, Alice Rio, I think, makes precisely this argument without using that term in her slavery book, uh, that these terms become important only when people look at them, when the situation arises that they need to be uh, important. Um, and I would sign on to that wholeheartedly because um, it goes a long way to explaining our evidence. But you've also put your finger on something more important when you said also by virtue of being written down, these formulas are making, are, are, are showing as snapshots that only exist because they were written down. And this gets at what Rosamond was asking about the, uh, the, the formularies creating realities as much as reflecting them. Uh, I would say that's a very valuable way of looking at it. <clears throat> we have now a question uh, from Moore. Yes. Thank you, Shaha, and thank you, Professor Brown, for a wonderful talk. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could um, say a few words about the protection you mentioned. So. Uh, you were saying that a person could have been sub subjected to a protection by an individual or by the church. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what, like, what was the difference between an individual and the church 
or maybe it had to do with the amount of people who were subjected to the same protection. So is there really a difference between uh, a wealthy landlord who had a lot of people under his protection or the church being a church? <laughs> I'm shooting from the hip here because I have not spent a lot of time directly thinking about distinctions among protection, but my initial reaction is no, there is no difference between uh, being under the protection of a major landlord and being under the protection of a monastery. You're dealing with a familia uh, uh, in both cases, the familia being that collective of kin, dependents, retainers, whatnot, that all are associated with a household or an institution. Um, and you can see a reflection of this in some of the formulas that say, you have to, I free you, but you have to be under the protection of either of myself or any one of my heirs that you might choose. So there's a bigger framework within the, which they can work. Um, so I would say I don't right now see any qualitative difference in the kind of protection we're talking about. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. We have another question from Dennis. Yeah, it's it's more to reiterate um, and to come back to the, to the discussion you had previously about the breviary of Alaric. So can we bluntly say that they used the language of the Roman law simply because they didn't know, didn't know anything better? because there was just not enough apparatus to talk about legal matters. If I were only looking at West Frankish sources, I would agree with you. Mm -hmm. But if you look at East Frankish formulas and East Frankish charters, you will find people very creatively finding ways to do the same things that the Western texts are doing. And they're not using Roman law to justify it. Um, the example that I've worked on most specifically has to do with the old Gestum and the Capalia, which was a late Roman forum for registering transactions. You had to show up, uh, have your document read out before an assembly. Uh, it would be transcribed into a set of public books and you would get a document saying that you had done this and that your transaction was therefore valid you see this procedure being perpetuated, particularly in the Loire Valley, but also elsewhere in the West, right through into the Carolingian period. We even have a couple of real documents that use this. But the key reason for using it is as a written form to demonstrate that your document has been validated. You see Eastern texts finding different ways to do the same thing. They show up and read the document before a king. They show up and read it before a judicial assembly. You'll find people carrying out a transaction in lo one locality and then walking a considerable distance to find a count in order to read it out and get a document saying that they had had it read it out. So I don't think it's not that they, they didn't know any better or they didn't have any other uh, legal language to use. It's just that in the West, Roman legal language still retained a great deal of prestige and authority. Uh, whereas in the East, people found different ways to carry out the same thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, it totally does. I myself work with the Anglo-Saxon material and it's plainly obvious that they're using their own concepts, their own language. I mean, even the language itself is Old English mm -hmm. and has very little, very little parallels with uh, the classical Roman law. And right. when the Normans are trying to, to back translate it into Latin, they come with all sorts of strategies of how to deal with concepts from trying to explain them, uh, simply transliterating, and so forth. Uh, very often they probably go on the assumption that the readership already know uh -huh. what this or that is. So they just like barbarically butcher Latin using mundum and mm -hmm. I don't know, like uh, Latinizing words, which otherwise make very little sense. Right. Um, so I, I guess it's, it's basically to, to draw a line here is that it's our problem that they in the West didn't know any better quote unquote that we're now confused with the concepts of libertas or with servus and so forth. So mm -hmm. they knew what they were talking about because to them it made all the sense. Yeah. But they use the language which to us is best represented in a discrete form in the period which preceded the one right. that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So, well. I like the way you put that. Thank you. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I'm, I, I don't like the way I put it because it makes our life so, so much harder. I mean, coming from the Soviet tradition and having to grapple with the Soviet historiography, I myself know firsthand how difficult it is to like, un untangle those concepts of freedom yeah. and freedom, uh, modes yeah. of production slash. Sorry, I'm going over the board. It's okay. Thank you for this question and for the answer. Um, if there are no other questions, then I, I will ask another question. Um, I wonder we, if we think about freedom as something that can be monetized for sure if you can sell someone, but, uh, if, but also in the sense that you can uh, pond your own freedom mm -hmm. in a way. I wonder what we can learn from juxtaposing cases of people, of fugitives. So if, if that, that is seen as stealing oneself, right? So uh, juxtaposing cases of, of fugitives and then stealing other people's slaves or colonies or kidnapping them mm -hmm. um, and um, and then putting yourself up for, for sale or for pawn, let's say, mm -hmm. um, if we can learn anything from this juxtaposition. So for instance, if the, the punishment for a fugitive would be similar in one way or another to the punishment for stealing someone else's slave. Hmm. I have to think about that. I'm not sure because running away or a servus, an unfree doing something active like that could easily draw corporal punishment. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I steal a servus, I'm just going to either have to return him or pay compensation. Uh, so I think it do does matter which direction the arrow points. Because or what is what is the status of the the culprit? Yeah. What is the, what, the of the what's the status of the of the actual agent? Yeah, mm -hmm. that was. I'd have to think about that some more, but that's my my first thought. Well, thank you very much. Um, please join me uh, to thank Professor Brown again for really a marvelous talk. Thank you. I appreciate it very much, and I appreciate the questions. And uh, so we the recording of this uh, talk will be uploaded very soon. Um, and we have our next meeting, mark it in your diary, in your calendars on December 22nd with Carmela Franklin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, everybody.